Hi everyone, Mrs B here, and I'm sitting here with my lolly bananas. Do you like lolly bananas? I do. The reason I'm looking at lolly bananas today is that we are going to be studying the esters. And of course, the esters are responsible for artificial flavorings in many foods, including the lolly banana. So let's get our PowerPoint on and let's find out more. This is not the first time that we've met the esters as artificial flavors. We already met them extensively in our study of the carboxylic acids. However, today, this video is focusing just on the esters. So let's have a look at the ester group. The ester group is this carbon with a double bond to an oxygen and a single bond to another oxygen. You'll notice that the ester group links two separate alkyl groups. So there are two separate alkyl groups. And one of these comes from the carboxylic acid that's used to form it. So this part of the ester comes from the carboxylic acid. And the remainder comes from an alcohol. And of course, we've seen the preparation of esters already in our reactions of alcohols video on esterification, but let's just run through it one more time. So we have a carboxylic acid and an alcohol. We need a strong acid catalyst. and we produce our ester and water. So this is when we produce water in a reaction, this is what we call a condensation reaction. So esterification is a condensation reaction. Let's have a look at an example. We have acetic acid and butan-1-ol. I do not like it when people say one butanol, it's butan-1-ol. You will see that in the literature, but let's stick with the IUPAC way. So what we have here is that the oxygen from the alcohol comes and joins onto the carbonyl carbon of the acid, and we eliminate water, and we end up with butyl acetate. So notice the first part of the name is from the alcohol, and the second part is from the carboxylic acid. Check out my video on naming esters if you need more examples to get a handle on that one. Now, for the longest time, chemists wondered whether the oxygen that's ended up in the ester, this oxygen here, whether that came from the original carboxylic acid or whether that came from the alcohol. So to solve this problem, they did an oxygen-18 labeling study. Now, oxygen-18 is a radioisotope, so it's detectable. And what was shown in this study was that if you labeled the alcohol with oxygen-18, So that means you produced an alcohol and you incorporated oxygen 18 into that alcohol as the oxygen. And then they tested the products. They separated the ester and the water and they tested to see if the oxygen 18 had ended up in the water, which would have suggested that it came from the carboxylic acid or if it turned out in the ester which would have um, suggested that that oxygen came from the alcohol. 
And what they found was that the oxygen 18 ended up in the ester. And that means that the oxygen in the ester comes from the alcohol, not from the carboxylic acid. Physical properties of esters. Esters do not have a hydrogen, so they cannot hydrogen bond to each other. They can only have dipole-dipole interactions because the carbonyl group is, of course, polar. We have a delta minus and a delta plus. And then we have our oxygen delta minus. So we can get dipole-dipole interactions, but we cannot get um, hydrogen bonding between ester molecules. Now that means esters tend to have low melting points and boiling points, lower than those of alcohols, so similar molecular mass, but they can have some hydrogen bonding with water. We get hydrogen bonding here between the delta plus on the water molecule and the delta minus on the carbonyl oxygen. So we can get that hydrogen bonding, however, that they'll be water soluble, but we know that as the carbon chain length increases, solubility in water decreases. So we tend to find up to about four or five carbon atoms, you get some solubility. However, because the ester has two separate alkyl groups, then you don't need those alkyl groups to be very large before the ester itself has more than four or five carbon atoms. So there are not very many esters that are soluble in water. Most of them are soluble in non-polar solvents. The chemical properties of esters, we're going to look at a re the reaction that occurs when we reverse the esterification reaction. We're going to start by talking about fats and oils. Fats and oils are actually esters of the triol glycerol. So glycerol has three hydroxyl groups and therefore it's able to have an esterification reaction with three separate carboxylic acids. And what's produced is called a triester. However, in, bio, in the biological world, the triester is called the triglyceride. Okay, so the triglyceride just means a triester of glycerol. Now, fatty acids are just carboxylic acids that have very long carbon chains. And when you get fatty acids and glycerol reacting in an esterification reaction, it produces a triglyceride or a triester, which we call a fat if those carbon chains in the fatty acids are saturated, or it could be an oil if the fatty acids are unsaturated or have double bonds in their carbon chains. Now, the fat is able to be split back up into glycerol and three fatty acids in the body when fats are digested. And this reaction requires water as a reactant. And when we have a reaction with water, we call this a hydrolysis reaction. And the reaction with water is hydrolysis. So when we talk about hydrolysis of esters, we're talking about their reaction with water. And all that happens is that the ester splits apart into its acid and alcohol part and the parts of the water go back on. So the hydrogens go back onto the alcohol. So we have our three hydrogens from the three waters going on to reform the glycerol. And we have our three hydroxyl groups, the other part of the waters, reforming the carboxylic acid. Now this reaction would be very, very slow. And therefore it's actually catalyzed by an enzyme and the enzyme is used for this reaction is called lipase. So that increases the rate of the chemical reaction. Now, if that occurs in alkaline conditions, then instead of forming the carboxylic acid, 
you actually form the carboxylate salt because as soon as the carboxylic acid um, forms, then it reacts with the alkali. Of course, alkali is just a soluble base. So you have an acid base reaction and you make the carboxylate salt. You still get the alcohol and alkaline conditions. And what's really, really exciting about the alkaline hydrolysis of fats and oils is that it produces soap. So this is what we know as a saponification reaction. So instead of reacting with water, we actually react with sodium hydroxide in aqueous solution. There is hydrolysis of the ester into glycerol and the three fatty acids, but then the fatty acids react with the sodium hydroxide and make the carboxylate salt. And in this case, where our carbon chain length in the fatty acid is 16, so the 14 in the middle plus the one on the end plus the carbonyl carbon, we end up with a soap called sodium palmitate. Generally, the fatty acids that produce soap contain between 10 and 30 carbon atoms. Normally though, that number is kept between 12 and 18. If you have fatty acids with shorter carbon chains than 12, they end up being quite irritating to the skin. But if you have fatty acids with longer carbon chains than 18, they tend to be quite oily, so they don't actually lather up very well. So generally, soaps are made with fatty acids that are the, well, they're the carboxylate salts of fatty acids with carbon chain lengths between 12 and 18. So let's have a look at the chemical structure of a soap. Soap molecules, they have that very, very long nonpolar carbon chain that came from the fatty acid. And that's really good for dissolving nonpolar grease in your skin oils. But they also have an ionic end because this is a carboxylate salt. And you might remember when we were talking about the carboxylic acids, that the carboxylate salt was always more soluble in water than the corresponding carboxylic acid because we could get iron dipole forces instead of hydrogen bonds. So this is a very, very useful molecule. Let's have a look at the action of a soap. First of all, when a soap is produced, all of those hydrophobic carbon chains, hydrophobic just, hydrophobic just means hating water, so not dissolving in water, but they can dissolve in each other. And they all have their ionic ends pointing outwards. So if you look at this in three dimensions, you end up with a sphere with all of the negative charge of the carboxylate salt on the outside. And so when you dissolve soap in water, you simply end up with millions and millions and millions of these little me cells just bobbing around in the water. Now, when it comes to some dirt on your skin, your dirt is being held on your skin by skin oils, and you have your soap molecules here, then they will actually come down and because the dirt and oil in your skin is non-polar, those non-polar carbon chains will end up dissolving the, dessert, the dirt and oil. So we end up here with the dirt and oil having all of those non-polar carbon chains coming and dissolving it. Now with a bit of agitation, that dirt can actually lift then off of your skin and be surrounded by the negative charge and so this droplet is soluble in water because of all of the iron dipole bonding with those negative charged heads. So you get iron dipole bonding and that enables your skin oils and the dirt that's held in your skin oils to actually be suspended 
in the water and washed away from your skin. We're going to start looking at the uses of esters in everyday life and we're going to start with the fats and oils. I mentioned earlier that if your fatty acid chains were saturated, it produced a fat, whereas if they were unsaturated, it produced an oil. Let's have a look at why that is the case. So fats are solid triglycerides. They're made from saturated fatty acids. And can you see that because the carbon chains are saturated, they're all the same shape and you get a fairly neat stacking of those carbon chains. And that neat stacking makes almost like a crystal structure. Regions within a fat have you know, these really perfect stackings and that crystal structure allows the fat to be solid. Oils on the other hand are liquids and this is because their carbon chains are unsaturated and the unsaturation in the carbon chains makes the molecule much more jumbled. And so you can see you've got one fatty acid chain here, one here sort of stacked on another one here, but you don't get that perfect stacking that you see in the fats. So that is the difference between fats and oils. Esters are very important solvents. They're important solvents in industry, even in everyday life. If you need to be taking off your nail polish remover, without damaging your nails and you want an acetone-free nail polish remover, then try ethyl acetate. Dimethyl sebacate is a plasticizer for synthetic resins. When we talk about a plasticizer, it's just a solvent that's added to make a resin more flexible to work. Um, dimethyl adipate is a blending solvent for adhesives. So your two parts of a, an adhesive that polymerize together are dissolved in the dimethyl adipate. You mix them together, the dimethyl adipate evaporates. Remember, esters are quite volatile compounds. And then you have polymerization. And of course, we've already dealt with the use of esters in artificial fragrances and artificial flavors. They're widely used in the food industry as artificial flavorings. That fruity odor also makes them useful. Additives to fragrances for perfumes, air fresheners, all sorts of things. So start reading those food labels and see what esters you are eating in your foods every day. We tend to talk a lot about esters being artificial flavors and fragrances, but of course they actually occur naturally in many fruits and flowers, and they're responsible for natural flavorings as well as the artificial ones. I hope you're enjoying this organic chemistry series as much as I am. Organic chemistry really is interesting because it is the chemistry of everyday life. If you enjoyed learning more about the esters, if you found that this video was useful in helping you to understand the esters, then please consider giving the video a like. And as always, join me on my channel. Please subscribe so that you can learn more about this awesome subject of chemistry. I am going to see you guys in the next video.